afflicted people. We are looking at the prophecy Isaiah during this Advent season. And Advent, as we heard earlier, both prepares us for the birth of Jesus, but also looks forward to the day when Christ shall return. There is the first advent, the first dawning of the arrival of the birth of Jesus in the manger in Bethlehem. And yet there is also this reminder that Christ shall return one day and restore all things. No more tears, no more suffering, no more sighing, no more sorrow. Heaven shall come to earth. But in the midst of that, we wait. And so for the next four weeks, we are going to be considering some of the prophetic words of Isaiah as we think about the gift, the gift of calling, the gift of comfort, the gift of hope, and the gift that eventually God literally shows his face in the form of our Savior. Now, if you know your home, if you did your homework, and I'm not going to ask how many of you actually did your homework before you showed up today to figure out who this Isaiah was, I'm going to give you some context, because if you know me fairly well, you know that I like to make sure that we kind of understand where we are and what's happening. So the prophet Isaiah prophesied from basically the year 740 BC to the year 685 BC in the southern kingdom of Judah. Remember, there were two kingdoms, the northern kingdom of Israel. Isaiah was focused primarily on the southern kingdom. He prophesied during the reign of Uzziah, during the reign of Jotham, during the reign of Ahaz, and during the reign of Hezekiah. 45 plus years. And the text we're going to look at this morning, which is a very familiar text, we read that Isaiah says, in the year in which King Uzziah died. Now, Uzziah had reigned in the kingdom of Judah for 52 years. That is a long run for a king. And many scholars actually believe that Isaiah and Uzziah were cousins, first cousins, because Uzziah's dad and Isaiah's dad had been brothers. So what that tells us also about Isaiah, though, is that he grew up in kind of this priestly world and and he was well-to-do and he was probably well-known. But King Uzziah had one major problem. He started really well. And if you read the story of King Uzziah, you know this, that as he started his kingship, he was faithful. He was very young. But as he grew in age, he cared for the people. He did the things that God wanted him to do. But then he made one major mistake, which meant that he did not finish well. This mistake is brought up in Second Chronicles chapter 26. We're only going to read the 16th verse, but I think it will help you understand what it was that King Uzziah decided to do. This is Second Chronicles chapter 26, verse 16. But after Uzziah became powerful because he was the king, His pride led to his downfall. He was unfaithful to the Lord, his God, and entered the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. Now you're thinking to yourself, what happened there? As a result of what Uzziah did, he was struck down with leprosy for the rest of his life. But what went wrong in that scripture I just read to you? You will recall in the Old Testament, there are three offices. There is the office of prophet, there is the office of priest, and there is the office of king. Kings are not priests. What did Uzziah do? I know you all just were like, okay, what? I just saw that on the screen. Remember, he went into the temple to offer a sacrifice on the altar of incense. And if you read in 2 Chronicles 26, all the priests said, do not do this. You are outside of your lane. You are the king. You are not the high priest. You are not a priest. You are to rule the people with justice and fairness. You are not to ask, act as priest. And as we know, as we're going to talk about next year, there is only one who fulfills all three offices of prophet, priest, and king, and that is Jesus. So Uzziah spent the rest of his reign isolated with leprosy. He did not finish well. 
And there's a whole other sermon I could do on that topic today, but that is not our topic for today, because our topic today is the prophetic words of Isaiah. And so for that, we turn to Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. Listen now for God's word. In the year that King Uzziah died, so 740 B.C., I saw the Lord, Isaiah writes, high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings, they covered their faces. With two, they covered their feet. And with two, they were flying, and they were calling to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is filled with his glory. And at the sound of their voices, listen to this language, the doorposts and thresholds shook and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined. For I am a man of unclean lips And I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar. And with it, he touched my mouth and said, See, behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away. Your sin atoned for. And then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, here am I, send me. I want you to notice the context of Isaiah's word that he gets from God. And I want you to notice where he is. Isaiah shows up for church on a Sunday morning. And guess what? God showed up as well. Do you think that when Isaiah went to the temple to go and worship the living God, that he really expected to have this vision of God Almighty in front of him, of God sitting on a throne with his robes flowing throughout all of the temple? Because Isaiah had a problem, and his problem was this. Who was going to be the next king of Israel? Because Uzziah had just died. And what does God want to do? God wants to remind Isaiah who it is that sits on the throne. That it is not about the earthly king, but it is about the heavenly king. Can you imagine how your world might change if when you entered in this place this morning for worship, God gave you that kind of vision. God spoke to your heart and your mind in such a way that literally, now we live in California, right? So we know what it is like for the ground to shake. Like we've experienced that. Many of you probably experienced the ground shaking when you've been in church, right? I've actually experienced that before. It's a little nerve wracking preaching in the midst of an earthquake, but that happens, right? Well, maybe not for all of you, but it's happened for me, okay? Um, but but this this sense of like, Isaiah had no expectation of what was about to happen. And God showed up in all of his glory. And Isaiah, we're going to come and talk about this at the end of the sermon, he was completely undone. Woe to me. I'm a man of unclean lips. He's a prophet, and he's saying this. And I dwell amongst the people of unclean lips. But what is God trying to do? God's trying to get Isaiah's attention. Because God has a plan for Isaiah's life. This is the gift of the call. And God asks a question. Whom can I send? Who will go for us? Who will represent me to the people of Judah? And he asks 
a question. And Isaiah responds, here am I. Here am I. Send me. You see, the reality of God and the reality even of a worship service is it is about a call and response. It is about the call of God. We see this played out in Isaiah chapter 6 where we, 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 we hear this antiphonal crying of these seraphim. That, that, that Hebrew word for seraphim there literally means fiery. Like they are creatures that are completely on fire, but they are not consumed because Isaiah has no other way to describe them. It's the only time the word is used in the entire New Testament. But they are flaming and they are filled with glory and they are speaking and singing Holy, holy, holy. And when you have two holy holies in the Hebrew language, when you have two words right next to each other and it's the same word, it is there for emphasis. So Isaiah now has it three times. That's serious holiness, okay? I mean, that's the only time it happens in in, in the Old Testament. It's a sense of like, Isaiah sees something and hears something that he has never heard and seen before. the glory of the living God. And God calls to him and says, I have work for you. And this happens throughout all of scripture, this call and response. So much so that Isaiah, and we think about this call and response of Isaiah, Isaiah is quoted more often in the New Testament than any other Old Testament book, including the Psalms. So when we see this call to Isaiah, it is a gift for us because Isaiah then gets quoted time after time after time in the New Testament. In another call story, we hear Isaiah quoted at the very end of our text. This is Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 23. And it's a story of particularly mostly focused on Joseph, but it is also the call that we know very well of Mary This is verse 18, Matthew chapter 1. This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, Do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place, this call of God to Joseph, this call of God to Mary. All of this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet Isaiah. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel which means God with us. You see, our calls are different. Mary and Joseph were nobodies. No one really knew who they were. A lot of people knew who Isaiah was, but it does not matter. What matters is us paying attention and saying, Lord, where would you send me? Now, I thought about being a little duplicitous in this text. If you've read through all of Isaiah chapter 6, um, you, you know it, 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 it's not easy sledding for Isaiah when it comes to being the prophet to Judah. I like Luke chapter 15. When something is lost and when something is found, there is rejoicing and there is celebration. And there is this sense of saying all three of those parables that Jesus says, let's come, let's celebrate. The one that was lost has been found. Now, Isaiah wasn't necessarily lost, but Isaiah was standing up. He was hearing God's voice. He had seen God's glory. God said, whom shall I send? And Isaiah says, send me. I am ready to go. I want you to notice that Isaiah says, send me before he gets his job description. Because if Isaiah had known his job description before he said, send me, he might have changed his mind. So just in case you're wondering, well, what exactly was Isaiah's job description? It is contained in the rest of Isaiah chapter 6. And I want you to listen closely to what God has to say to him. God said, after Isaiah said, send me, go and tell this people, 
be ever hearing but never understanding. Notice this. Be ever seeing but never perceiving. Make the heart of this people calloused. Make their ears dull and close their eyes. Oh, we're not done yet. Hold on. Just keep going with me. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn to be healed. God says to Isaiah, you're going to go speak clearly and you're going to speak plainly. No one's going to hear you. No one's going to listen to you. No one is going to understand you. And God's not done yet. Then Isaiah said in verse 11, for how long, Lord? Always the cry of the prophet, how long? And God answered, until the cities lie ruined and without inhabitant, until the houses are left deserted and the fields ruined and ravaged, until the Lord has sent everyone far away and the land is utterly forsaken. Don't know about you, but that's a long, long time. And though a tenth remains in the land, it will again be laid waste. But as the terebinth and oak leave stumps when they are cut down, and now notice this line, so the holy seed will be the stump in the land. That last verse gets us ready for Isaiah chapter 11, which we're going to look at next week. But notice the call that is given to Isaiah. It is not easy. It is fraught with peril. And God says, I'm sending you even though the people may not listen. Even though they may turn their back on you, I am still sending you. So I want us to think about this idea of calling. And the calling that I want us to consider is more than just our occupation. It is so easy, and I do this all the time, that after you meet somebody, what is one of the first or second questions you ask them, other than like, where do you live? You ask them, what do you do? Right? How do you make your money? And we don't say quite that. How do you make your money? We don't quite say that. But we're interested in what occupies your time. Instead of asking a question like, what are you really passionate about? Not everyone's passionate about their occupation. But there's this word vocation. It comes from the Latin word vocare, which means calling. If I were to ask you, what is your vocation? What is it that you feel called to? What would you say? You see, God is a God who calls. God is a God who stirs our hearts. God is a God who gives some of us occupations. And he, gives, he is a God who gives all of us a vocation. What stirs your heart? What is it, and I like the way Frederick Buechner puts this, I'm going to paraphrase it, I'm going to give you the exact quote, but Frederick Buechner, great author, one of my favorite authors, has this way of saying, whatever it is that you need to do most and whatever it is that the world needs most done, that's what you need to do, or this quote here. The place God calls you to, this is your calling, this is your vocation. This is maybe your occupation, but for many people, it is not. The place God calls you to is the place where your deep gladness and where the world's great hunger meet. Where your deep gladness, where that thing that stirs your heart and you cannot help but say yes to it, where that converges with the world's deepest hunger. It's this idea of 
many people who have different passions and care about different things. But where does that meet with the world? There are those, and, and this is why all of our callings are different, because some of us care for the unhoused and homeless community. Like that's, that's where our heart becomes alive. Some of us care for the refugee and immigration crisis that we're experiencing. That's where our heart comes alive. Some of us are deep, deep, deep people of prayer who fall down on their knees on a regular basis and pray the living God for all the suffering, all the strife, all the brokenness that's happening in our world. For some people, that's their vocation, their calling. How well are we listening to God? It's hard to do. And I don't know about you, but Christmas, when it should be easier to listen for the voice of God, seems to become a lot more cluttered. All the things, all the commitments, all the activities, Are we listening for the voice of God? The God who calls you to a place where your deep gladness intersects with the world's great hunger. You see, for me, a part of my vocation is I love to share God's word. I love to preach and teach, and it is what gives me life. And I do that in a world that is hurting and broken and needs to know of the Savior. That's the convergence or part of my vocation. But what is it for you? Where is it that God is stirring your heart and saying to you, I'm calling you. I want to send you. And are you ready to say, Lord, here am I. Send me. Now, as I wrap up my sermon this morning, I want to come back to Isaiah. And that moment that he sees the glory and the wonder and the beauty of God, and he says, I am completely undone. Woe to me, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell amongst a people of unclean lips. And what happens? The seraphim flies to that fire, grabs a coal with the tongs, flies to Isaiah and places it on his lips and says, your sin is atoned for. You are forgiven. And so we come to this table this morning, not needing that coal, not needing that fire, because guess who has taken on that fire of God's wrath? Jesus Christ. And so we look from this table and you look over my head and you look up to the cross. Because on that cross, all is forgiven. And you are a new creation. And it is because of that that you are then not only able to hear what it is that God has to say to you, but you are able to say, Lord, Here am I. Send me. Send me. And so as we receive the Lord's Supper this morning, I would ask that you reflect on where it might be that God is calling you. And that you might turn to God and say, Lord, here am I. Send me. Pray with me, please. Lord, we gather at this table And we recognize that we are a sinful and broken people. But Lord, the invitation still comes. All you who are weary, come near to me, and I will give you rest. Lord, we confess our sinfulness and our brokenness. 
We thank you for the saving grace of Jesus Christ who has touched our hearts and our lives. The gift of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. So feed us now at this table. Remind us of our forgiveness of sins. Set us free to go and serve you in joy and in peace. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.